Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another OpenShift Commons Briefings. We're really pleased that you've joined us today, and um, I want to welcome the folks from Crunchy Data today. They're going to um, regale us with some wonderful cloud-native GIS applications using Crunchy Data on OpenShift. And we have um, with us today Steve Pusty, Paul Ramsey, and Adam Tim. Um, Steve is one of my favorite people, um, longtime uh, Red Hatter and um, fellow evangelist back in the day. So um, we're really thrilled to have him back here. And we've always very much loved um, our wonderful partners, Crunchy Data. So um, I think this is going to be a lot of fun. Some really great demos um, are in the offing. So Steve, um, why don't you introduce your team, take it away, and we'll have live Q&A at the end. So um, thanks again for joining us, everyone. Thanks, Diane. It's really great to be able to hang out with you again, too. I've missed it. Um, so I'm Steve Pusty. I'm the lead of developer relations at Crunchy. Um, Paul Ramsey is the, is it, I think it's executive engineer, senior engineer, something really high up in the, and the, the for the purposes of this talk, um, the important part about Paul is he is one of the founders of PostGIS. He's the lead committer. And he and Martin Davis are the two that built the, uh, Crunchy Data's Crunchy Spatial platform, which we'll be demoing today. Adam Tim, he is a wonder guy who goes between sales and consulting and grant writing and PMing and doing all sorts of stuff. Um, he's a former NGA. I don't know if he was an analyst or not, but he was at NGA, so he cares very deeply about spatial stuff. But also being at NGA, he also was on the beginnings of cloud native stuff that the government agency was doing. So today, we're going to talk to you about some cool stuff that we've done um, from actually from soup to nuts uh, with crunchy data, Postgres, some cloud spatial stuff that Paul will introduce in a little bit, and we'll be running it all on OpenShift. So let's go ahead and get started. Oh, I got to click on the actual window. All right, so there's us. Oh, sorry. Paul's the one in the middle. Adam's the one who looks like he might be an NGA agent anyway on the, on the far right. And that's me on the far left. Actually, it's no hair framing the hair guy is what we're actually aiming for with that effect. <clears throat> um, what we're going to do, we're going to talk about some cool stuff with Kube, PostgreSQL, and spatial microservices. And of course, since we're on the Commons one, our version of Kube is going to be OpenShift. And then we're going to use these pieces to build some cool stuff in real time. So we're going to spin up all, well, part, well, you'll see, but it's almost exactly real time. Loading data is slow, so we're not going to show you loading data. Um, other than that, everything's going to be real time. Uh, who's Crunchy Data? Just for a quick overview, uh, the leading provider of trusted open source PostgreSQL technology support and training. Um, basically, if you want to think of who we are, um, we're the Red Hat of PostgreSQL, right? That's our business model. That's what we aim to be. Uh, we have we are, have some of the leading contributors to PostgreSQL code, like Paul, but also Stephen Frost, uh, Tom Lane. Uh, Joe Conway, approximately one third of the contributors to Postgres, right? So we can both influence, we can, we can do stuff in the code, but we can also, you know, we're deeply connected to the community. Uh, we're, everything we do is 100% open source and runs on Postgres, right? So no, no um, open core, everything we do is pure open source. Uh, we, our claim, just like Red Hat's, is engineering quality support, right? So that's one of our big ones. Uh, we have, you get calls with, Skilled PostgreSQL engineers, 24-7, 365, usually 20 minutes or less. And so one of the examples would be like if you had something going on with PostGIS and you were one of our customers, you probably wouldn't get Paul on the immediate call, but you get Paul probably on the second call after they'd figured out what the problem was. And then one of the other big things for us is commitment to security conscious enterprises. You know, we have a lot of security clearance and we've built, we worked on the STIG for Postgres. So uh, we've done a lot with security. And we're cloud and platform agnostic. And we've been working with containers since day one with OpenShift. Actually, with OpenShift, we were building containers back when OpenShift was not running on Kube, but we quickly made the, uh, the conversion to Kube and OpenShift. And then we have been doing an operator for quite some time, and you'll see it in action today. Uh, so here's just some stuff about how we've worked with Red Hat before. Uh, Ansible Tower now uses Postgres behind it. And Satellite also uses Postgres behind it. And we are one of the preferred partners if you want HA Postgres behind Satellite or Ansible Tower, right? And 
we anywhere else you want to do uh, if you're running like um jira or if you're running what was the jfrogs i don't remember jfrogs but behind jfrogs we can run behind jfrogs as well for ha um so here's what ashesh the gm cloud bu i think he's a senior vice president now um uh, for red hat and cloud in general and here's what i'll let you read it i'm not going to read it out loud um well, actually, I should in case there's someone that's hearing that's vision impaired. We are very excited to see the great results of the work that Crunchy Data has put into containerizing and operationalizing Postgres in the OpenShift environment. Having effectively built a database as a service infrastructure, Crunchy Data has made it easier for application teams to use the power of PostgreSQL in their modern architectures. So that's from Ashesh. And then Chris Morgan, the lead tech marketer, one of my good friends on Red Hat Cloud. Um, this is about our operator certification. And this is just to attest how long we've been doing the operator on Cube with Red Hat, right? So as they, and we're actually in the catalog as well. As they have for several years, Crunchy Data has been a first mover in their collaboration with Red Hat. Being one of the first partners to embrace the operator frameworks demonstrates this, and we're excited for Red Hat OpenShift customers to be able to take advantage of this technology to help address their PostgreSQL needs in a scalable and repeatable fashion. And quickly, if you know about operators, which you should, since you're on the comments call, we are actually at phase five. So. We're on the autopilot mode for our operator. And you'll see a demo of our operator. Adam's going to demo that in a, a little bit after Paul does his thing. So I tried to go through that relatively quickly because I know most people don't want a lot of marketing. So if you have questions, you can put it in the chat or reach out to, we have a slide at the end of how you can reach out to us. I am now going to turn it over to Paul. Great. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the motivation behind, uh, behind Crunchy Spatial. Um, so it's not uncommon in our connected world for you to want to put a map on a computer, um, but if you're coming to the problem for the first time, it's all too common to be sucked into the tar pit of being told that you need a great deal of different new extra complex uh, software to do it. You need a geographic information system, my friend. You need a GIS. But actually, if you're building an app, probably you're building an app using a database underneath it, you've got Postgres in your app, um, which means you can easily have PostGIS in your app, which means you already have the GIS. Effectively, PostGIS gives you all the functionality of a GIS without having to bring the GIS into your infrastructure. You already have the functionality in your database, in your spatial database, Postgres with PostGIS. That means you can answer GIS-y questions, things like what parcels are within a kilometer of the file. That's a GIS-y question. Um, it's a question you can visualize in a mappy sense, what things are within a than a thousand meters of the fire. And you can express that, the answer to that question in SQL if you have a spatial database. And not very much SQL either. This is one SQL statement, it's five lines, it's a few enough words I could count them on two hands. Um, how far did the bus travel last week? That's also a GIS -y question. You can think about it in a map, you can express it in spatial SQL. Um, find me the nearest truck to the transformer, that's actually a somewhat more complex question because I got two things going on there. I got transformers and I got trucks. Can I find the closest thing uh, using just spatial SQL? Yes, I can. Uh, not even very much. This is an index nearest neighbor query. Um, what trucks are in the service depots? Uh, trucks and service depots, two layers. This is a, an example of a spatial join. Again, you can express it in SQL and hardly any SQL at that. Um, so you can get all the functionality of a GIS without the GIS when you've got post GIS in your PostgreSQL database. Um, so <clears throat> you're building a web app, you haven't sold, you think, how do I get this wonderful thing? I'd like to use this, um, this GIS without a GIS that you speak of, Paul, how can I get this wonderful thing? And uh, it's in the Postgres database, so you just have to connect to port 5432. And you're building a web app. Um, you're building an app that runs, sides and runs inside your browser. The things you connect to from that web app are Web things, you're connecting on port 80 or port 443 um, for SSL. Um, so you've got this disconnect here. You've got a web browser sitting out there that wants to connect things on HTTPS. You've got this database back here, which likes to talk to its clients via the uh, Postgres query, uh, query protocol on port 5432. How do you join these two things together? Historically, again, you might say, uh, I need a GIS, or rather I need a GIS middleware. And we looked at that and we said, you know, you can do that, but those GI, the GIS middlewares that, are, that existed um, and still exist are, are quite heavy. They do a lot of things. And we already have all the things back in the database. So we need the smallest thing that can do what we need in order to bind a web app 
to the spatial smarts of PostGIS. Um, that is, we want to be able to send a query over HTTP, and we want to get back one of two things, either map tiles so we can make a visual display, or GeoJSON so we can get a little bit more interrogation into the features um, and make something a little more interactive with features. Um, those are the two things we want back to be able to put into a map panel to be able to build into a spatial application. So we asked ourselves, um, looking at sort of the big weighty spatial middleware, what is this, what's the smallest piece of software that can do the thing we want? Um, and the advantage of small um, <clears throat> is that it's easy to deploy. Um, it's easy to take a small thing and put it in a container because it doesn't have a lot of moving parts. It's easy to reason about a small thing. It only does one thing, so you can figure out how it works. Um, and because we're doing all this in open source, another real big advantage of a small thing is it's easy to contribute to. Contributors can come in, they can look at the relatively small code base and say, I need to do this one extra thing. Here's a contribution. Whereas it's a very large, substantial project that can be a very big problem just to figure out how it works before we can contribute. Um, so what's the smallest piece of software that can solve this problem? Um, and so we started building these small pieces of software. Uh, we built two to start with. We're just calling it uh, post just for the web, post just for the win. Um, PG TileServe is a very small piece of software that provides HTTP endpoints so the web browser can talk to it uh, and exposes the tables and functions in the PostGIS database returning vector tiles. And vector tiles, which you'll see in the demos that Adam's going to provide, um, give you a rich, um, attractive, and also potentially interactive way of working with, uh, with spatial data in a web map. PG feature serve, uh, same idea, except that it returns GeoJSON collections as the response. It gives you endpoints for tables and functions um, and returns collections. So post just for the web is GIS without the GIS. Um, it lets you take your web app, bind it to all the smarts, the GIS without the GIS and post just, and build rich web applications without having to commit idea, yourself to huge chunks that of GIS returns GeoJSON collections. And that's the motivation response. for, uh, Gives for crunchy spatial. For tables and functions um, and returns yeah, collections. Kick it back over to whoever's next. So post just for the web is GIS without the GIS. Without um, it lets you take your web app, bind right. it to all the I smarts, saw. the GIS without the GIS and post just, and um, build rich web applications without having to commit yourself to huge chunks of the GIS returns return. GeoJSON collections. And that's the motivation Spons. for, uh, for crunchy spatial. Tables and functions um, and returns yeah. collections. Kick it back over to whoever's next. So post just for the web is GIS without the GIS. Right. Um, it lets you take your web app, bind it to all the smarts. All right, the so the GIS, Paul, just, just did an uh, awesome job giving us you know, a brief view of kind of the motivation and behind Crunchy Spatial and, and the motivation and for, uh, for PG for Crunchy Spatial and tables and functions. So what I'm going to walk through uh, now is how we to actually to put that so into post just for uh, web world practice uh, using OpenShift. So the demo architecture that I'm going to show you here uh, it starts obviously with PostGIS as our data layer. We're going to do an awesome job with the feature uh, tile serve in our microservice layer. We do have a raster tile map server uh, to serve up uh, uh, static base maps. Uh, so you have something nice to look at underneath your, your vector tiles. Uh, and all of that is going to be served up into our custom written uh, demo application, which is uh, a React application. So I'm going to do that in real time uh, here in just a minute. And then once uh, I walk through how to build that up in real time uh, in OpenShift, uh, Steve and I are going to show how you can do editing in real time uh, in a cloud-based database. Uh, and it's actually going to be leveraging another feature found in our uh, Postgres operator for Kubernetes that allows for multi-cluster replication between uh, two Kubernetes clusters. So when we get to that part, what you're going to see is essentially the same application, uh, but now we have two separate uh, clusters of OpenShift uh, stood up, and we have two, um, two versions of the application, one running in each cluster, and, uh, but only one of the applications is the primary application, but data is being uh, automatically replicated and fed over to our standby cluster. So if for whatever reason something happens to your, your entire Kubernetes cluster, um, you have the ability to fail over and restore your, your application in very short order in your standby Kubernetes cluster. Um, and also some of the inherent features built, built into our operator uh, that, that come out of the box are high availability, 
uh, for your Postgres database, and we're gonna we're gonna show how an auto failover works over just in in our primary cluster as well. So uh, that's what I'm gonna show you here in, uh, in just a second. Let me go ahead and exit out of this view. All right, so uh, what you should, what everybody should be seeing here is I have my two terminal windows where I'm gonna be doing the majority of my work, and then I have my OpenShift cluster UI uh, here on the uh, left side of the screen. And Adam, as I'm uh, working Adam, in my terminal, you'll start seeing pause and Adam, jump in. Yes, Steve? We don't see it. We're still looking at the it? slide. Yep, yep, All right. correct. Let me, uh, let me reshare. Nice, nice, Adam. Well done. All right. We have the technology. Surprisingly so. All right. yes. So, like I was saying, we've got uh, we've got my my two terminal windows where I'm going to be doing all of the the main work. But you're going to start seeing uh, all of our pods dr uh, drop into uh, my OpenShift uh, UI over here as things start getting built. So, uh, what what are we going to end up building? Uh, so this is this is a, a view of the end user application that we're going to end up building. It's a it's a demo application that we we built just to show off uh, the power of Crunchy Spatial and PostGIS and, and uh, Kubernetes. And what you're going to see is it's a pu purely fictitious uh, application that we thought might uh, be representative of how a, a fire administrator in Santa Cruz County would be managing parcel information uh, to uh, denote whether or not a parcel is considered a fire hazard or not a fire hazard. So what you're gonna see is all these green and red lines are uh, tax parcel information that we actually downloaded from the Santa Cruz County website uh, GIS website, and we loaded it all into a database, and then we fed it out through PG TileServe, and we interact with it through PG FeatureServe. And what uh, what allows you to do is select on a, uh, on a particular parcel, and then uh, it allows you, uh, in this view, it would, it's uh, meant to represent a fire administrator being able to change whether or not a parcel is considered a fire hazard, save that off, and then the, say, the, the update is actually done directly in the database. And then the next view is uh, same map, same, uh, same view, but only in this case, a fire administrator may want to let a, uh, a, a number of residents in a particular area know that a uh, parcel is being updated to be considered a fire hazard. So it allows you to do a geospatial query, again, directly against the data in the database, and none of this is being done in the UI, and return all the parcels that interact or intersect with that query radius. So obviously we've already got this application stood up and running. I uh, just wanted to let you get a, a sense of what we should see working uh, when, the, when the demo is completely done here. So with that, let me go ahead and drop back into this view and we'll go ahead and get started. So the first thing that I need to do is I'm gonna make sure I'm actually in the demo project space. Uh, so I'm building these things uh, in the right space so you can see it working. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch to my demo project, and I'm gonna start by actually building our uh, UI first, since the UI is actually the part that takes the longest uh, to, to build in this, because we are actually building from source using the source to image uh, feature in Open, OpenShift. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and drop that command in here. And you can see I'm just grabbing it from my own Git repo, a particular branch, and telling it to use the source uh, strategy. And I'm going to go ahead and kick that off. And if we go over to our builds, we'll see that is actually where it, well, wait for it. Might take a minute. There we go. Uh, so now it's actually going. We'll we'll see. We should see a build config pop in here. Oh, there we go. There's uh, my build config that popped in, and we should see the build start going here in a second. So while that's while that build is going, uh, this React application needs a couple more a uh, couple more things to make sure it's uh, running appropriately. So I'm going to go ahead and set a uh, the environment variables in the deployment config for this particular application. That's necessary. So this is in particular germane to spatial or anything like that. This is uh, in particular a, a more of a React function. So I'm updating uh, the deployment config for this. 
And you can see that just got updated. So if I go here, I can take a look Adam? at environment variables. Yeah. Um, your screen is well behind your voice. Um, what we're seeing on the screen, just to let you know, is that fire notification. It's still showing that screen. We have not yet switched oh, to wow. showing okay. all the work yep. that you've done on the other terminal. And, and Adam, you. so uh, it might okay. be that your 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 Wi-Fi is a little lag time. So maybe turn off your video if you don't mind, um, and that might be the load on your computer. Yep. So I'm going to do that. Okay. So if you don't see his face now, that's my doing. We look very, Adam and I look very similar. So you can just look at me and pretend yep. I'm Adam. Okay, okay Adam, well, hold on. You're just resizing your stuff. Um, you can, now you can start over with, uh, from the part where you entered the, there's Adam entering the command to you. Yep. He's logging in to the demo project. And he's building this uh, OC new app, which people should know. He's building this. This is a um, a node, a JavaScript application that we built using React on the front end. And then you can see that, like Adam was saying before, there's the build config coming up, and that build's going to be kicked off. Um, so that's going to be doing the whole um, source to image process inside of the OpenShift build. And so that build's running. Adam, where did you leave off? Oh, no, uh, now sorry, he's setting, um, just... he's setting some environment variables, right, for that app. You can see that there on the right side. He's just doing the OC set env for the deployment config for spatial web demo. And that's updated. And, then and that should be where I, I stop. I, I, I left okay. off. Um, now and you're exposing nice. the service. Yep. So we'll go ahead and now we're caught up to real time. So okay. I'll I'll start walking through here. Hopefully me turning off my video is, is gonna help keep things a little bit closer to real time. But Steve, please let me know if it starts uh, lagging in any way, shape or form. Sure thing. So and then the next thing I wanna do in this project space, let me go back over to my pods view here, is, uh, and you can see every time I made an update, it, uh, it created a new uh, deployment uh, for that. And so the, the next thing I wanted to be able to do is add in that static map tile server that I mentioned we needed to have. So again, this is just a custom map tile server that we built for this, this demo. Uh, you can uh, replace it with your own uh, map tile server. There's a bunch of different map tile servers out there. Uh, again, not particularly germane to anything uh, related to Postgis or the spatial product, but something necessary for the overall application. All right, so now we've got the map tile server and we've got our UI, but we don't have any data actually um, uh, up. We actually don't have a database. So if I went to the uh, just the view real quick here, we can see we've got uh, the spatial web demo, which is our, our front end, but uh, second, but it actually won't have anything in it. So I won't even bring it up because you'll see just a, a blank app there with no map. Uh, on there. So now we actually want to get into the meat of the demo and start uh, deploying our backend Postgres database. So I'm going to switch to a the project where we have our operator deployed, and that's called PGO. So now I'm in the PGO space, and I'm going to log into our PGO client, which you can have. Uh, you can have the PGO client. Uh, it's just a CLI tool. Uh, you can have that loaded on your local machine. We also do offer oops, the ability to deploy it actually into the cluster where you have PGO deployed. So uh, that way you don't have to be dependent on anything locally on your machine. So now I'm uh, remoted into the client itself. And here's where I can actually issue the commands to uh, deploy uh, the cluster that we need. So first off, let me find where I'm at here. There we go. So what I want to do here is using, again, using the PGO operator, which is Crunchy's operator for Kubernetes to deploy Postgres clusters. I'm going to issue a command to create a cluster. I'm going to tell it to create it in the demo namespace where I'm building this application. I'm going to give my Postgres cluster a name called FireApp. I'm going to tell it which uh, particular image of the Crunchy containers that I want it to use. And that is the Crunchy Postgres 
GIS, so that, that means that it comes with Postgres pre-installed in our HA container. I'm going to create a database as part of this command. I'm going to call that database fire data, and I'm going to tell uh, Kubernetes that I want uh, one replica uh, created in, uh, automatically on this, and then I can define my password for Postgres as part of this. Uh, if I left this off, then Kubernetes would go ahead and automatically create a random uh, a random secret and uh, in the the cluster, and uh, I wouldn't have to specify this. I'd just uh, specify the password for the sake of this demo, just to make it a little bit cleaner. So I'll go ahead and kick that off, and you can see it went ahead and uh, kicked off a workflow. And if I do a PGS show. We can see that it's uh, in the process of creating uh, the initial cluster, and then it has uh, the uh, the replica running or starting to run as well. And you can see over here the first uh, container just created. We've already got our backrest repo uh, created here, and now it's spinning up our our primary uh, cluster node. And once this is done, we'll see another cluster pop in here as well. So I'm going to give that a second to run. And then the other thing I need to do is, uh, again, based on the way we have this data structured, I need to create one user. Um, again, this is all being done through our, our Postgres operator, and I need to create a user called Groot, and I'm just gonna have Kubernetes manage the, the password for, for us here. But again, telling it where what namespace to look in and what uh, cluster name to create the user in. So if I do that, you can see I uh, created our user there. And so now we have a Postgres cluster or a Postgres cluster. We have a user created in our space. Um, and so now we need some data in that space. Now, as Steve said, we're not going to go through all the painstaking steps of actually downloading uh, shapefiles and loading in. We do have a database uh, backup pre-staged. So I'm going to switch down here real quick and switch to the, the demo project just so I can stay logged into um, PGO up here. And then you can see now we've got a primary cluster, or a primary uh, database running, and then we have a backup still in the process of being spun up here. So I'm gonna go ahead and remote into this one. So now I'm actually in the inside the pod in in uh, OpenShift. So I'm in this pod and I wanna load data into that fire data database uh, that we created there. So I'm just gonna go ahead and issue a, a psql command. So like I said, we've got this uh, this this Postgres backup uh, pre-staged in Amazon S3, that's gonna pull it down and it's gonna load it directly into the database in real time. So you can see uh, just that quickly pulling it in uh, and restoring the database backup. And we're done there. So now we have we have a front end, we have a map uh, map server, we have the database created with the data in it, um, and the Postgres uh, extension created in there by default because we use the Postgres uh, container. Uh, but we still have not connected the back end to the front end. So now I'm going to deploy PG Tile Serve and PG Feature Serve and connect that to the database. And when PG Tile Serve and PG Feature Serve are created, they automatically expose the data in inside the database and make it available, which those REST APIs are already part of the web front end. So when we uh, when we actually connect that, and now I'll actually jump over here so you can see where where we're at. Um, so real quick, like I said, so here's our here's our demo front end that we actually just built. So it looks very similar to what I, I showed you earlier, right? There's no changes. The only difference is we don't see those green and red lines here, right? We've got the base map, uh, but and we've got the overall UI framework, but we don't actually have the data. So just uh, just to show that I'm not uh, don't have any tricks hidden up my sleeve here. So and for ahead. those who are, are wondering, the, another name for that base map is the raster tiles. So when um, the, when Adam was talking about that before in the architecture, that that's basically just a pod that's just serving up raster images that mosaic together to form that base map layer. Yeah, and a, 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 maybe an easier way to show it, right, is um, so here is the demo front end that 
that I just had OpenShift build for me, right? Like Steve was saying, here's the raster base map, and here is the one that we're going to be doing the real-time editing in, in a little bit. So you can see you got the green lines and the red lines. Those are the actual vector tiles being served back up directly from the database, which we're going to actually implement those services uh, now. And here's our demo front end. You can see those, those lines aren't there. So hopefully that, that makes it a little bit clearer. All right, so jumping back here, go back to my view here. All right, so I exited out of the, the database pod uh, in this window, and now I'm actually going to deploy PG tile serve and PG feature serve. So again, using the new app flow, we pull down tile serve, and again, just that, that quickly, it pulls down the container image, and to connect tile serve um, to the database, we need to set a couple of environment variables. So the first one I, I wanna be able to set Actually, here, hold on a second, make sure. Pull this back up a little bit, make it a little bit easier because it's hard to, for me to see at the bottom as well. So the first environment variables I'm gonna set is I'm gonna set the username and password uh, that PG Tile Serve is gonna use, and I'm gonna grab those directly from the Kubernetes secret provided by OpenShift. And I just do that uh, through this uh, OC set environment command. You can see I'm grabbing the Postgres secrets and I'm uh, pending the PG uh, prefix to it. So there'll be PG username and PG password in there. And I'm adding it to that deployment config. And then once those are actually set, uh, the other environment variable that I need to create is the actual um, the database URL environment variable. And so this is what PG tile serve actually uses uh, to connect to the Postgres database. And you can see I'm actually defining what that environment variable is there. But again, using PG username, PG password, uh, grabbing the Fire replica, uh, the Fire app replica uh, service host. Um, and so that's the, actually provided um, from Kubernetes. And notice I'm using the replica. So when I created the Postgres cluster, it created a primary and it created a replica database. I'm actually connecting PG tile serve to the replica database because PG tile serve is a read only transaction. It's not actually doing any updates to the database. So we can use the replica service host on that because the replica database is a read only database. So we wanna offload uh, any sort of workload from, uh, from the primary database uh, and put it on the, the read replica. So we'll go ahead and create that. So update the deployment config. And you can see, because I didn't have the deployment configs completely correct, you can see PG tile serve actually aired out because it couldn't actually connect to, to the database. But now that I've actually got it connected to the, data, the database, it's completed, it's uh, actually running and it's up. And the last thing I'll need to do is just expose that service so we have an available route to actually access it from our application. So go ahead, expose that service. So if I jump back over here to my routes, now we have PG tile serve. And just to give you an idea of what that looks like, here's a basic UI out of the box from uh, that, that comes with PG tile serve. And we can go ahead and click on this preview. And again, this is just a, it's a, a memory limited UI. So you're gonna see these uh, vector tiles come in in a very spotty way because there's just a lot of them but you can see um, all of the, the vector tiles returning back here and it returns all the attribute information contained in the database. Uh, we are not gonna be using all that attribute information in our, in our end UI, uh, but just let you know that it is made available to you through PG tile serve. All right, so I'll close out of that. So we've got PG tile serve there. And if I actually, actually. Wait, one more thing, Adam. So yeah. this is what Paul was talking about before with why a vector tile is better than a base map tile. So if you looked at, if we went to the base map tile and clicked on the map, you wouldn't be able to get all this information returned for each individual parcel, right? If this was just vector, if this was just raster tiles. But because it's vector tiles, we can actually tag information to all the vectors, it allowing us to not have to necessarily go back and forth between the web server and the database server just to get display of information. And you can also style on the fly, right? The raster tile server, the one that we had before, those are raster images, I think JPEGs or PNG, something like that. So once you make that styling, you're done. Here, you can dynamically style the tile, the vector tiles and their, the, the parcels in them based on any of those attributes that you see there associated with them. So it gives you a lot more flexibility in terms of um, display and cartography. Yeah, thanks, Steve. <clears throat> 
And so now I, I brought up the demo application that we're, we're building in real time. And by comparison, now you can see it looks very similar to uh, this, uh, the, the, the application I brought up initially. Um, but now I can, I can click on this, but the UI doesn't let me do anything. And that's because all these interactions uh, through the- You're behind again, Adam. Hold on, you're behind again. Oh, sorry. Are you look? Are, I'm assuming right now you're actually looking at the demo app, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. We're not. Okay. We're still seeing the vector tiles. We're finding okay. out that that the internet is not evenly distributed today. Um, no. In, no. In, in rural Wisconsin, wherever you are, the digital divide exists. It, it is. It is very, very real. Believe me. Yes. <laughs> I, I can imagine, and uh, we, there's, there's much more work to do. Yeah. Um, so let me know when it's caught back up to kind of the base map there, Steve. Okay, still waiting. Still waiting, that's okay. I was joking with Steve a minute ago is that a long time ago, I, um, uh, I was doing demos on OpenShift and I was demoing deploying WordPress with OpenStreetMaps and um, things like this. And we, there we go, we've caught up now. And it, we've come a okay. very, very long way. So um, now we're on your screen. Um, okay. All right, so what I, what I uh, was starting to show is, um, so even in the, in the demo UI now, we've got, we've got the parcel layers here, right? We, you can, we can see the green lines, the red lines. We can even click on them to select them, but when I actually try and use the interface here, it, it doesn't do anything, right? You can see an error has occurred, and that's because we haven't deployed PG Feature Serve yet. PG Feature Serve is actually what drives the interaction or allows the interaction with the database. Um, and that's because all that interaction is being done through functions that were created in the database, and we'll, we'll walk through that as I, I build out PG Feature Surf. So go ahead, I'll go ahead and reduce this back down. All right, let me clear this. Talk slower, Adam. We gotta wait for it to catch up. Okay, there, good. We're back. I'll, I'll take longer pauses. There we go. Nice, nice. Be very contemplative. Good, yes. I like it. All right, so first I'm gonna go ahead and same workflow that we did for, whoops, not, uh, I don't wanna expose the service yet because it hasn't been created. So same, same workflow for, um, that we did for PG TileServe, I'm gonna do for PG feature, feature, PG feature Serve, or maybe I'll just uh, stammer and stutter a lot and that'll take a lot, of, a lot more time. So same thing, grabbing our PG feature Serve container, pulling that down. We're gonna set the same environment variables that we did for PG TileServe. And then add the, uh, add the database connection URL as well. And actually before I post that in there, I'm gonna go ahead and clear this out just to make sure uh, it's a little bit easier to see here. So the main difference though is because PG Feature Serve is actually going to be updating data in the database, we don't wanna connect it to the replica service host, we're connecting it to the primary. So you can see that right there, and that's because the primary is what allows us to actually make changes to the data in the database. So PG, um, PG Feature Server is connected to our primary database, PG Tile Server is connected to our replica service host. And that's actually gonna be something important to keep in mind in a little bit as we show the auto failover workflow. Uh, between the two here. So I went ahead and updated the deployment config there, and then last but not least, expose the service out. And so now, jumping back over to this UI, I can go to our routes, and you can see we've got PG Feature Serve as an available route now. Bring up the PG Feature Serve, uh, just kind of stock engineering UI, and if I go to collections, you're gonna see the same uh, layers that, that we had available through PG Tile Serve. These are being returned back as uh, OGC APIs, uh, though, so there's, they're a lot more rich, a lot more um, uh, feature dense, if you will. Um, and it, <clears throat> we also have the ability to view functions. Now, if I click on here, we don't actually have any functions available to us yet. We are gonna create those in just a minute. And as I said before, the interaction for our application is actually being done through functions that reside in the database that are accessible through PG Feature Serve. And so even though we have PG Feature Serve deployed now, it is actually available through an API. If I go back to our demo application here and refresh, I still don't have the needed interaction. Um, I can still click on these, 
I can highlight them, but when I try and uh, do anything, it doesn't actually do the update, again, because we're missing those, those couple of key functions. So the functions that we're going to add are two, uh, two pretty simple ones. We're gonna add a parcel within distance that's gonna be able, that's gonna allow us to do our distance query and then our parcel set fire hazard function. And that's what's gonna allow us to set the attribute information in the database uh, from uh, the fire hazard attribute from either yes to no or no to yes. And so you can see here's, here's the code that uh, is required to create those functions. And so now I actually need to create those in a database. Well, we've got this saved off as a, a data de definition language or library uh, in the SQL format. And I've got that pre-staged. So in the same way that I was able to uh, restore our database backup, I'm gonna do the same thing down here. Go ahead and just RSH back into that database. The other thing I should add in here as, uh, oh, come on. Uh, so right now, PG Feature Serve has to look for the PostGIS FTW schema. So you can see over here, that's the first thing that happens in this, uh, in this DDL is we actually create that schema. Then we create the functions within that schema. And once uh, those are both created, we'll be able to see them in the, uh, in the PG Feature Serve UI. And I should probably stop trying to multitask because I keep messing things up here. All right, so now I just remote it back into the primary database pod. And now I'm just gonna go ahead and grab the command here to restore that DDL. So again, in the same way that I was able to do the database restore, just go ahead and grab um, the pre-staged. Um, oh, that didn't work, why didn't that work? Try that again. Didn't work because it's live. Of course, that is exactly why it didn't work. Second here. You want to try uh, curling it directly from um, GitHub? No, hold on. I got to be in a temp directory. There we go. Okay. And that time, there we go. Helps if I have the uh, have it in the right place to actually be able to write the file. So there we go. We can see that uh, pulled down that, that DDL and then just loaded it directly in. It's got a whole bunch of awesome uh, coordinates in there uh, as part of the test. And so now going back over to our interface here, let me go full screen, go back to my PG feature serve UI. And if I view the functions, now we can see we've got the two functions that we need here, uh, the parcel set fire hazard, parcel within distance, and jumping back over to our demo UI. Now we'll see that we've got a fully functioning interface here. We've got all of the, uh, the attribute information back here that wasn't present before, and I can go ahead and hit yes, and you can see it changed to red because the attribute information was actually updated directly in the database, and I can go over to the active fire notification and select that, and now I can do my distance query. We'll do a different distance this time, and you can see I'm getting all that, that information returned back. So now we have a fully functioning web application and it was all built out in the real time. That took me maybe about 20 to 25 minutes, including time to actually pause and let the, uh, the system uh, join up here. And so I'm gonna go ahead and make a couple more changes here and we're gonna do just another quick live demonstration on the failover capability. So you can see I'm making a, a few changes here. And the reason why I wanna do this is to show you uh, that it's actually being stored off in real time in the, in the backup and it's gonna be uh, restored from failure. So we can, um, so I changed this, this parcel, this parcel, and this parcel uh, to red uh, from green. And if I go back into, uh, let me shrink back down here real quick. So 
Remember this view, I'm still in my primary Postgres pod. And so I can see <clears throat> uh, PG data is where all of the primary data is actually restored. And let me just do one more quick PGO show up here so you can see. So here are my, my uh, databases running in my cluster. So we've got my primary here. So remember uh, W7CJ2 is the primary and the replica is GNTSB. So I'm gonna go ahead and intentionally crash my database, which is always something fun to do in a live demo, right? Cause that's, that's what you hope doesn't happen, but we're gonna go ahead and do it just to show how auto failover works. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove the PG data file and uh, lowercase r. Oh, thank you. And it said permission denied, but actually if I go back up here and show, um, you can see now our primary cluster is in an unknown state because I corrupted the, the data file. And now it automatically, in just that amount of time, it switched the GNTSB to primary. So it actually tore down uh, and it's in the process of restoring the former primary back to a replica. And you can see just that quickly, now that's back up on replica. Now <clears throat> you can see, well, obviously nothing happened here. If I go back here, um, all the data is still the same uh, as we had it before. But remember when I, when I connected PG tile serve, it was connected to the replica service and PG feature serve was connected to the primary service. And so I can still go in here, even though the cluster has failed over and the nodes are not the, or the pods are not the same anymore. I can still go in here and make updates uh, to the database. Let me select that one. Let me change that back to no. And you can see the, the interface is still fully functional, fully, uh, fully working. And just that quickly, um, the operator went ahead and failed over from the replica to the primary, and there was no impact to our user application. So um, when you're talking about a, a mission critical application, a, a business critical application, uh, data assuredness, you wanna make sure your data is always up, always available. Um, having a highly available Postgres database driving your backend application is a critical piece of that and really helps make sure your, um, your, your application is always up and your data is all of it, always available to your end, end users. Uh, so Steve, that, that wraps up the real-time build of the single node is, instance. Do we wanna switch over and show how you can remote in uh, using QGIS and doing data updates? And then we can also show how it's being replicated between the two clusters. Sure, before I do that though, can I put you on the spot? Sure. Um, do you remember the command to scale up the replicas? Oh, uh, yeah. So what? I, the reason why I wanted to ask Adam this is, so we showed um, that the failover happens, but also you can set auto tuning for um, the, uh, you can set auto tuning to let it scale up on its own. We don't actually enable that for the most part because databases are really, you don't want to be spinning up replicas and creating all that bandwidth in general, but you can manually go manually go in and if you do this again, um, you'll see that we can actually now actually just create an, another database replica on the fly. So if we were serving up a lot of tiles and it was really there, so it just created two more replicas, right? Yep. So we just increased by two more. So now we're running three replicas, and this is also the part that shows. Um, how PG tile serve and PG feature serve running inside of OpenShift are cloud native, right? Because this, you know, there's no state stored in PG tile server, PG feature serve, right? There's no state stored in there. All the state is in the database. So if you really actually need it, we're now reading off of more replicas, but we can also take tile serve and we can just go ahead and into the, yeah, just scale it up. And it doesn't matter, right? Like that's, just, it's always talking to the service. So it'll know how to route to the rep, to the replicas that are behind that service. And now we have three. And so they're load balancing to the replicas in addition to having three new services coming up, right? This isn't something where there's state stored somewhere other than, like there's some other um, map servers out there where they store state actually in the application itself. And those become very hard to scale up. And they're actually quite a hog in terms of resource usage 
If you look at feature serve right now, so if you click on, do we have metrics for them? I can probably, yeah, let me hop over. I think if you just click on the, um, oh yeah, you can click on that too. You can, well, that's the, the larger view, but if you if we look at it later, um, we're gonna actually be able to see the metrics for the specific pieces. And you can see that they're basically consuming almost no resources to do their work because they've built in a lightweight cloud native format rather than a one app server to rule them all kind of format. So I just wanted to make that point clear while uh, Adam was doing his demo. So I'm gonna switch, take control now. Yep. And so let me make sure people can see, you can see my map. Absolutely, yep, we can. Okay, so this is the exact same app, exact same map um, coming off of Adam's space from before, right? And you can see we've got the, let's see if, I don't know if we're serving in the exact same, let's check. Let's go here to refresh the state on the map. We come back here. This is the one of the demo, because this is actually in the failover cluster that, um, you know, that replicate we had where the data was being replicated between actually two distinct OpenShift clusters. I'm attached to that data set right now, right? And that cluster, this is the primary in that cluster. Um, that's why you don't see Adam's changes because it pre-configuring all that cluster change is not something we can do easily on the fly. I mean, we probably could have, but it's in, in the essence of time, we preset it up beforehand. So what I'm gonna show now though, is it's quite often in GIS frameworks that um, the users are desktop application users not web users, right? Like, so that web administrator view that we showed before, that might be good for someone who's not into the GIS stuff, but for the GIS people, they actually usually use a desktop application. So I have a desktop application up. I'm, I did a port forward. So here you can see me, oh, it's not on the screen. Here you can see me port forward to the primary, right? The primary doesn't have any letters. There's like a, the, the, the replica has some letters, an, another set of C, random letters in it. So we're actually talking to the primary um, and I've port forward 5432 to 5432T on my local machine, which is um, the port for Postgres, right? So we're connected to that, move that back out of the way. And then I'll bring up the desktop app. So inside of here, I had already made a fire spatial connector right? And that is actually connecting to the database in the, in the primary, right? And we can see all everything in there. I've already dropped assessor parcels on here. If you, we're going to actually update this parcel here. This one was already fire. So if I click on it and we look all the way, I don't know if this is actually viewable on your screen, but if we look all the way, let me see if it, where I can find it. Uh, so fire hazard, Oh, we clicked two, we, we were too far out. I need to click that one, yeah. Let me scroll down again. And went too far. Where is fire hazard? Anybody see it? Then you might've just passed There it is, there it is. I yeah. th there it is. So you can see it's set to yes. And if I go back to my map view quickly, you can, we're looking at this parcel right here. So we're gonna do the use case where there's a GIS analyst, a desktop analyst back at the, the main G spatial processing center for the fire department or for the county. And they said, oh, you know what? We've gone out and inspected this one and this parcel is actually now high fire potential. So what I can do here is I'm actually gonna select this parcel, right? And we can look down at the fire hazard again. And it's, uh, where'd it go, where'd it go, where'd it go? There's a lot of attributes, but you can see this one says only yes portion. So not the whole thing. We want to change that. So what we're going to do is we've selected this. We can bring, we can start editing on this. So toggle editing. Now this allows us to make changes through here. And then we bring up this form for changing things and we scroll down to there. Oh, no, that's timber. It always get, that one always catches me. Here, fire hazard. So we're gonna go and edit it, All right? So we're editing on the primary. There we go, it's all done. You don't see anything in the GIS view because you wouldn't. Um, 
did I toggle editing yet? Nope, I gotta turn off the editing. So that saves, so this is basic, toggle editing basically opens up a transaction. And when I save, that actually commits the transaction to the database. And now, if I go back to my view and I refresh the page, I mean, if we were really fancy cool, we would have some sort of web sockets, but it doesn't happen off enough to do web sockets. But now you can see that the, the, it's gone out to the replicas, right? Because the replica is controlling the, um, the tile serve. And you can see that tile serve is now saying, this is a fire hazard map, right? This is fire hazard. So that was right to the primary, repli replicate the data to the replicas and then serve it up and change the map. And so you can do this whole, you can do a dual, um, a dual functionality or dual user type role given that we can have stateless servers and that we have access to this database with its all its replication set up for us out of the box. And so you can have desktop people changing data and analyzing data, and they're the only ones that have permissions instead of doing it maybe through here, or you can have web users do it and it's all synced up together. The other benefit that would have happened is uh, in here, if I wanted to run those functions in the FTW, post just FTW schema, I could have actually run those functions as a call inside the database here. So like Paul said in the beginning, we believe like, not surprisingly, that the database is the center of all the knowledge. And this way, any client that connects can actually use the same functions, change the same data, everything's replicated and synced up and the database is taken care of by the operator. So with that, I'm done with the changes. And now comes the part like the 1812 overture where the cannons go off at the end, where Adam, hopefully, fingers crossed, Adam um, was going to demonstrate failover between clusters. So let me, Adam, you can take back the, go ahead, uh, take back the presentation if you want. I'll stop sharing, or you got it. So, um, yeah, we're, the, the, uh, the, the 1812 overture is gonna be a little less dramatic. Um, I'm not gonna demonstrate, demonstrate the, the full failover, but what I, I do wanna demonstrate is just the, the replication between um, the, the failovers, because as I, as I was showing before, um, in a single cluster, you can do automatic failover on a, on a single pod. Um, <clears throat> between two clusters, it is a little bit of a manual failover process. Um, when your primary cluster goes down, uh, you switch over to your standby cluster. You have to bring that down and then you have to promote it back to a primary. It can happen very quickly, um, but it's not automatic. Um, and so, and you also want to be very deliberate about that because maybe, um, maybe your primary cluster, uh, you want to just go ahead and spend the time to bring your primary cluster back up, your primary uh, Kubernetes cluster, and not do the full failover. So you want to be a little bit more deliberate between failover between clusters. But what I do want to show is, so <clears throat> here we're back in, um, we're back in OpenShift, obviously, and I'm going to go ahead and jump to. Um, so instead of the demo project, I'm going to jump down to the project that Steve was just showing. And so here's where where we have um, all of the uh, we have the multi-cluster uh, version of it stood up. And you can see we've got our the same version of the demo here. So I'm going to go ahead and clear all these out, make sure I'm using the right one. And so we have this version of the application running in the primary cluster. Here's the, the version running in the standby. You can see there's a little number two uh, right here that tells me I'm on a, on a different one, but uh, they, they should look uh, identical. And what I'm gonna do here is, you can see here are the, the changes that Steve just made. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, change this back. I'm gonna say, Steve, you messed up. No, that's actually not a uh, fire hazard. And it turns out this one wasn't a fire hazard either. And so I'm gonna go ahead and change that to no. So you can see these two have been changed to no. I'm gonna hop over here back to our, our standby cluster. You can see these, they're still showing up as red. That's because uh, to replicate over there, uh, it does have to go through an S3 bucket and it takes about 10 seconds or so for that, that replication to actually happen in full. So I'm gonna go ahead and just give it a couple more clicks. And you can see already just in that a little bit amount of time, these two have, uh, have changed. But again, because this is on the standby cluster, I can't actually make any changes to this one because this entire database, including the primary one, is marked as a standby. So uh, we're not gonna run into any sort of 
um, transactional conflicts uh, by somebody accidentally going to this one and trying to make an update to this one, it's not going to let me because the entire database primary and replicas are only in read only, and they're they're uh, they're pulling from the primary cluster uh, in the the primary Kubernetes instance. Um, but I still have the ability to do my uh, radius search here, uh, just because that's that's a uh, just a basic query there. So I can go ahead and do that. So. Um, hopefully that, uh, that highlights the ability to not only do a highly available uh, Postgres instance in a single cluster, a single Kubernetes cluster, but also being able to do replication between Kubernetes clusters. Um, and again, uh, there's all sorts of interesting different uh, architectural things that you could, you could do with that. Now, again, when you're replicating at the database level and you're making sure that all your data is consistent and available throughout your architecture, and if any one part of your overall enterprise architecture goes down, you have your data available in, in different instances and you can quickly restore and, and bring that back up and, and replace your active application. And so with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and bring the slides back up here, hopefully. And so as Steve mentioned, uh, if you want to learn more, uh, you can always uh, go to our website uh, and learn more about uh, Crunchy Postgres for Kubernetes uh, and the documentation. We do have a learning portal, so if you go to crunchydata.com, go to our learning portal, or learn.crunchydata.com. Uh, Steve's got a, a great site there uh, full of Kata Coda courses, uh, not only for the Postgres operator, uh, but a, a bunch of other Postgres courses. You can learn more about Postgres, uh, obviously Crunchy Spatial, or you can uh, email us at info at crunchydata.com. So with, with that, Steve, I'll hand it back over to you. Any any closing comments? No, I just, I, I hope people got a sense of the way that we've moved into a cloud native architecture for Spatial, right? Um, if you look uh, back to the, can I just show my slide just for a second? I'll yeah. show my slides, here we go. So if we look back at this architecture diagram, I don't need to do the two different ones together. All of this is made possible by OpenShift, right? This high level of automation. If you notice, there was basically, we had similar commands for every single thing we did, right? There was a common operating plane coming through OpenShift. So if you were to stand up this cluster yourself, you don't have to learn how to install Postgres, right? You don't have to learn how to install PG feature serve. You don't have to learn how to scale it up. You don't have to learn how to put the load balancer in front. You don't have to do any of that stuff, right? And Or even the tile map server, which you could scale up. It's the same um, paradigm you would use for anything else, like Nginx or uh, JBoss EAP. It's all the same paradigm for how you work with it. And the ni other nice part is we've got tons of automation going that is just taken care of by the platform itself. You saw the power of the operator. Right, so the operator knew how to do failover on its own. We didn't have to read through and configure and do all that stuff that we would normally have to do to set up um, primary and read replicas or the failover itself. That's like, that's years worth of work that all comes out of the operator framework and what we've done at Crunchy to build that Postgres operator. And then you saw we build PG feature serve and PG tile serve to be cloud native. They're small, there's no state, they scale up, they, they respect the way that Kubernetes is expected to work right? You just set a couple environment variables for the password. You can actually even set them as um, in the deployment config directly. We built the configuration of it to work with Kubernetes and OpenShift, right? And so then you can build your UI layer, but all of it's taken care of and you're not learning some new paradigm. So we believe this is the way forward. I mean, Kubernetes, the cloud, all that stuff has really made it nice for us to do, as Paul said, post just for the win or for the web, both of them together, right? Um, you can, it makes it much easier for everybody and in a scalable way. So uh, I just want to end and we love talking about it. So any questions, shoot them our way. Absolutely, I, and um, I'm sure we will. Um, and this really, I think you really have shown us the, the path forward for cloud native and the future of GIS being a cloud native um, uh, serious offering here. This is really amazing. Um, I know, you know, the internet may have failed us a few times here, but if people really clue into this uh, replication between clusters and the different things that, that we are showing here, this is um, light years from where we came, um, you know, uh, jokingly with, you know, plugins to different things and, you know, the, the ability to drill down and scale this stuff now um, is just amazing. 
So I really appreciate you guys taking the time here. Um, we will definitely have you back um, and do more co live coding demos because this stuff is just great. Um, if you could throw up your last slide there with the resources as well, because I think that um, would be a great way to end. And I don't know if um, Paul is, if Paul's still hanging around there. Um, I'll put up the last slide, but Paul's still here. Yeah, if, if, if you want to just say um, where, if people want to get involved in the open source side of this, the post GIS, where, where people should go to find you to um, participate in that community. Yeah, if you want to get involved in post GIS, the uh, community site is postgis.net and Excellent. everything's from there. All right, awesome. Wait, so, wait okay. hold, on, hold on, I'll bring it up and I'll show. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Perfect. Let's go back to, uh, where is it? No, that's not what I wanted. Do I want this one? Hold on. Let me get rid of this. There. Because that's, prob that's then... probably Steve's homepage. <laughs> exactly. Which I just have QGIS of all the time. Um, where is, oh, here's what I wanted. Here we go. Right. So here, um, PostGIS is, PostGIS, is it? Post dot. Net. 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 So this is the PostGIS site. And then there's a whole part on it about development. Right, so here's how you get involved. They've got a nice list. They're very friendly people. Paul, I think it's Paul, mainly Paul and Regina that run it. Is that right? Pretty much, Paul. Uh, me and Regina are the most uh, consistent people around. But there's a okay. there's a development community of about a dozen regular contributors. Okay, but Paul and Regina are the. I don't know about the other. I don't know the other people. I'm sure they're very nice too. But Paul and Regina are some of the nicest people I know. And then, if you want to get involved with our other projects. They are in github.com slash crunchy data, right? And their repositories are, here's PG TileServe right on the front page, right? And as Paul said, it's really slim code. Like if you dig into this, the, I think the biggest thing in here is probably the documentation in Hugo, right? Or the examples. Uh, most of it's happening in a, he's doing it because the database is so powerful, you can basically, this is just a very small shim layer that just handles the HTTP to database transactions, and that's all it's doing. The database is doing all the work, so you don't have to do all this complicated calculations or writing inside the code. And then the other one is the exact same way. This is the one that Martin works on, which is feature serve, and it's the same. Um, one thing we didn't get to show that I think I, w I would like to show since APIs are the future, if we go back to, uh, now I have to find it. Three deployments. I'm confused. I mean, I'm so used to the three dot what X OpenShift interface that I get very confused with this new, um, this new uh, interface we're, that you guys have going. We're currently running a um, customize your UI contest. So um, if you're into that and you want to customize it backwards so it looks like the three three dot X console, yeah, you can enter yeah. the console. <laughs> That's what I'll do. I'll just basically <laughs> take the code base from the three dot one. I customized it. Look. Um, so I, I wanted to go to the routes is really what I wanted to do. I was trying to find the route. So here's the feature serve, right? I'll bring up feature serve again. And that, the thing I think that's really cool is features, the GIS world is usually a couple of years behind catching up the rest of the programming world. And, but this time it's really great. Um, Adam mentioned we're OGC compliant for feature serve. OGC is kind of like the W3, is it W3C, right? Is that the working group for the web, right? The o OGC is that for spatial. And they're doing a whole, new, they're excited. They're doing a whole new, um, they're doing a whole new configuration of it, of their rewriting their specs so that they're actually modern web. So the new feature serve spec is actually open API compliant. And so as we bring this up, wait for it to wake up a little bit. It should be bringing up a swagger interface to the feature serve but the internet is not with us today so internet it's waiting for unpackage.com there must be a third-party library that it's waiting for that it can't get so if i stop it maybe there we go so now you get the you get the swagger spec for the feature serve so you can interrogate it just like you would any other api right and it behaves exactly the same way and again it's stateless right so it's restafarian or rest like in what it does so you can look at get the collection, right? How do I make that call? We put all the, the uh, documentation in it. So I, I'm really excited about how we're pushing spatial forward.
focusing on the database, storing state in the database, but then making the other layers lightweight on top and cloud native. So now I'm done growing about our site. And now is, is Restafarian a thing? Or did uh, you just- I, I, I say that just because, you know, there's a guy in, um, in the spatial community, Sean Gillis, who was very early in REST. And there was a bunch of us who were like tracking REST. And Sean was very Restafarian. And I think Restafarian are the people who find fall, follow Fielding's original dissertation and say, unless you're doing the original dissertation version of REST, you're not doing REST. Those are the Restafarians. And Sean was one of those people. And I was not. I was just like, a, am just going to do what makes my life easier and programming easier. And if I put some function calls in there or something, so sue me. I don't care. I'm just yeah. going to make life better. Hypertext well, is the engine of state, and I will fight you on that. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, oh. Paul is also a Restafarian, too. Oh, this I, I can see there's there's a debate coming here. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, goodness. Well, thanks again, everybody, for coming today. Um, you know, as we said, the Internet's not distributed equally, but um, I think we, we got the gist of everything here. And um, I'll put this up on YouTube shortly, uh, probably end of day today sometime, and you will see it. Um, and we can annotate it, put links into some of these things. And if you share me share with me your slide deck, I'll also um, link that into it, too, as well. So um, great work. Um, amazing partners um, at Crunchy Data. Love what you're doing. Um, with both GIS, um, Paul, so keep keep doing the good work there. Um, and anything we can do to promote this, um, I'm, I'm thrilled with it because I don't know anyone on the planet who doesn't like good maps. And um, that, yeah, really. And we use Only them. people who have problems don't like good um, maps, that's yeah. all. Yeah, yeah, who, anyone who does it. I don't know if you can see it, but like I'm, I'm a huge map globe enthusiast. I even have my light bulb out there in the background is my um, is is how hooked I am on mapping. So I so appreciate the work you guys do. So take care. Um, we'll talk to you all soon. Um, someday we'll see you all again soon in person, hopefully. And so stay safe. Um, keep doing the good work. Um, and um, we'll talk to you all soon. Take care, guys. Okay. Thanks, Thanks Dan. Dan.